It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is 2020 Hindsight. So let's get personal pretty quick here. As you look back just from today, today back to your birth, however far you can remember, um, you've got 2020 hindsight vision. So what have you learned? What have you done? What have you not done? What kind of assessment have you made? You would think, well, if I'd lived however long you've lived, you say, well, not that long or maybe a very long time. Uh, wow, I've, there's a lot of things that went wrong. Well, what would you do about that? Did you learn anything? Did I learn anything? Have I learned anything? from my own history, from my own issues. Because if you can look back and say, well, I, you know, I got into some trouble when I was 12 or 16, started drinking, smoking weed, doing coke, stealing, lying, whatever you were doing, and you say, well, yeah, that's just pretty much who I still am, then something has gone terribly wrong because no corrections have made, especially if there has been consequence along the way, and in spite of the consequence, you still lock up and say, no, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and then you wonder how that's going to work out for you. Proverbs 26, 11, and it's, not, it's pretty graphic. Uh, if you've ever seen this or been a party to this, you know what I'm talking about. Proverbs 26, 11, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. So what does the Bible compare us to? If I have had a struggle with something, this has been the folly of my life, and I keep going back to it over and over and over again, it is literally like a dog that throws up, laps it up, and goes again. You say, oh, I don't want to think about that. Then don't be a fool. Why are we such fools? Where we go back over and over and over again. Now go to Proverbs 27:12 complete opposite. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. The simple pass on and are punished. So now if you're just a kid, if you're young and you don't know better and you're ignorant and you're borderline a little bit foolish, stupid, whatever word you want to use, you go, okay, well, we'll excuse that. The problem is that when you have 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds still behaving like 12 year olds, it's something's not working. Right? So you look at your life and say, Lord, why have I not learned anything, not from history, from my own history? A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. So what does that mean? That means you see something coming, you go, this has gotten me in trouble my whole life. I'm not going to call this man's name, but a guy that comes to our church. And there are literally things, functions he will not come to uh, in our church because going to those functions will take him to parts of town where he got in tons of trouble. You say, well, he should be over that. Maybe he's not over that, but at least he knows that he doesn't have any business in those parts of town. So he's not even going to get near trouble, right? Or people that say, well, I can't drive home that way anymore because all that trouble in my life. Go out of your way to go around that. Now you say, well, maybe one day that'll change. Until it does, what does it say to do? foresee evil, hide yourself. Learn from your own history. This is not going to go well. Wisdom, now just listen to me a minute on this. Wisdom gives you the ability to look past the situation or temptation and see the consequences or possible outcome and make a decision in the moment. Okay? So you say, well, I, I pray for wisdom. Proverbs replete wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. The New Testament, ask God for wisdom. He'll give it to you. Why do you need wisdom? Because wisdom is not smart. Smart people do crazy things. Wise people don't end up in the same situations because wisdom gives you the ability, and I use this illustration along the way, if, if you ever 
came across a wise fish, it would be in the lake. Wise fish, always in the lake. Why? Because some guy who's trying to trick them, deceive them, with a pole, with a line, with a certain kind of line up to a certain point, then the filament or whatever changes to the hook so the fish can't even see the change of line, and then the hook, then the, then the bait, and you dangle it there, do your ripping, whatever you're doing, and what are you trying to do? You're trying to trick the fish. If the fish has ever been caught and could somehow size all that up and say, no, thank you, I'll find my own worm, no hook. I'm not playing your game anymore. So what does the devil do? Lies to us, we'll get that in a minute, tricks us, deceives us, constantly trying to bait us to get our attention. But if we don't have wisdom, then our bodies, our flesh, our brains say, oh my gosh, I, I, this is going to be amazing. And if you sat and talked to somebody for three minutes less and said, dude, what happened last time you went down this road? Oh yeah, that's right, dude, that didn't go well. And I ended up in jail or or almost ended up divorced, or whatever the scenario was, and you go, okay, you're right. Why is it so important to have accountability? Because without accountability, we're idiots, right? We end up in terrible places doing terrible things. So wisdom gives you the ability to see a situation and to see beyond the situation and say, I'm out. I don't want anything to do with it. Um, the advantage we have with this book right here and you would think this would fix it, right? Here's a Bible. So Old Testament, New Testament, there are people that lived before the New Testament, had, no, had a kind of an idea what was coming, but no idea really the details that we have. There are people in the Old Testament didn't have the Old Testament. You think, oh, everybody just went down to the you know, bookstore and got them a Bible, a scroll, and had them at the house. Nobody had, we, we got the whole thing. You would think being able to own an entire Bible, have access literal 2020 hindsight vision of everything that happened from Jesus back at least in a few few years past him we would be able to just take that and go oh my gosh those stupid crazy people look at the trouble they got into I see the answer now I'm not going to do any of that right and yet what do we do we do the same silly things we get in the same trouble because just seeing it somehow doesn't fix it um, go to Genesis chapter 3, back to the left just for a second. Um, and, and again, I'm giving you some hindsight here all the way back to the beginning. And I made a mistake today. I ran the who made God trap in my brain and I almost didn't make it out of the shower. So I was, I was like, don't do that. That'll really mess you up. You know, you start with God and then just for that split second, who made God? And I, I just don't recommend that. That uh, Just wait and ask him where he came from when you get to heaven. Um, so you got God. Uh, let's kind of go through this before I read this. God, and before the world was created, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So before that, there's something before that, lots before that. You've got, you've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit in heaven. You've got Heaven, you have no universe, okay? And if you think the universe is big, what in the world is heaven, okay? Because this universe is just a temporary thing that he's built to, to say, look, you know, you're dealing with, a, you're dealing with an, an awesome God, um, and we still don't get that. So, but in, in the pre-existence of the world, he made angels, okay? So you got God the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, you have the Trinity, and at least the angels, and something goes terribly wrong, the most beautiful angel, Lucifer says, it's not enough to be made by you, I want to be equal to you. He gets tossed, pushed out of heaven, he didn't fall, he got pushed, you're out of here. And a third of the angels with him, and so that's just going on before anything is created. So the situation when God creates the heavens and the earth is you have war in heaven, you've got problems in heaven, in the heavenlies, the spiritual realm, and then God says, I'm going to do this. So he makes Adam and Eve, um, and then look at this, look at what happens in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, 
Has God indeed said? Now, this, that little thing, if you feel comfortable underlining things in your Bible, underline that statement. Has God indeed said? Because that's where he starts with us. If you don't know the truth, then you don't know what's up. And then when the enemy comes, whether it's a snake or he's a snake in many, cat in many forms, people come along and just that little insertion of, okay, well, I know what you think he said, but did he really say that? And then you start going, well, maybe not. Maybe I misunderstood. Well, yeah, that can't be true. And then, boom, you're, you're off the path. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. He did not say that. That is not what God said. God did not say you can't touch it. If you go back and read previous where he really, what he really said is you can't, you can't eat of it. They could touch it, they just couldn't eat of it. So he's, the, the serpent is questioning her, has God indeed said, and then she by herself skews it a little bit and comes up, well, we can't, we can't touch it or eat it. And that is not what he said. Now, why you, you say, well, you're getting all specific about this. Here's why, and if you want to go back and verify that, go to Genesis 2, 16 and 17. That's what he really said. You say, well, why, do you, why are you splicing hairs? It's not splicing hairs. You have to know what the scripture says. You've got to know exactly what it says because that is the truth. And you've got to hold to the truth or you will get skewed just slightly. And then you're off and running just a little bit. Keep reading there. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now that's a lie. So he starts questioning what God said and then flat out tells her a lie. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And here we are. So because of the enemy getting to Eve, Adam, getting them, what has God indeed said? We're in this mess. You think, well, yeah, but that's them. They were, they were silly, stupid, crazy people. Like, who would, I would never do that. And every day of our lives, what happens? The enemy comes along, the father of lies. So let me tell you something about your hindsight vision. The only way you've screwed your whole life up from today to back to your birth is somewhere along the way you started believing lies you cannot be a Christian without accepting the truth, which is a person, not just a, a series of facts. It is a person. And then you say, okay, I, now I know the truth. But if you have the truth, that truth will set you free from what? From sin. The primary thing that the enemy uses in our life is lies. And we take the bait over and over like a dog going back to their vomit. Let's move on. Let's, let's, let's do the next thing. You say, well, I don't know what the next thing is. Why do you think as a church we are so huge on discipleship? Because you got born again if you're a Christian, but someone has to raise you. It's, it's what was intended. Why do you think Jesus picked 12 and took them to be with him for three years so that he could get them up and running? They could see how he did it, see what he said, see how he lived. And then when he actually physically was gone from them, he said, look, I'm not going to leave you by yourselves. I'll send another helper, one just like me. And when the Holy Spirit showed up and moves in them physically, into their bodies, they go, it's him. And then they picked up where they left off with Jesus inside of them, processing them, helping their life, living not just with them, but now in them and through them. That's what you got. So you say, well, I don't want to look stupid. You already look stupid, <laughs> right? You're worried about looking stupid. We all look stupid when we just get in the hamster wheel and we become a Christian and then just live there for 40, 50, 60, 70 years and then die. That's not what was intended. We're supposed to be free. We're supposed to live like he intended. So you have to know what to do with the lies when they come. So here's the next 2020 hindsight vision I would like you to consider. I'd like you, and I know you say, well, I don't know how much time I got left. If you're... Let's assume you're 20 years old and you got, how many more years you want to give yourself? 70? 70 more years, okay? So everybody in your mind decide a reasonable number you think, you know, maybe I'll die at 90. 
So I'm going to jump to 90. And so um, I'm over here 90 years old, and I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to look back till today. So by faith, I'm jumping down the road and turn around and looking back at my life. What was different about your life from the day you died to now than now to the day you were born? And what are the corrections you're going to make? What, you say, well, you know, I've been thinking about that in one day. I love the one day answer. Let me tell you something about today. It is one day. And if you keep postponing these one days to the next day to the next day, then one day you actually are on the one day that you die, and then you look back and go, wow, what was that? How did I end up in that same hamster wheel? I didn't make any changes. I didn't grow. I read the Bible a little bit, but it didn't work for me. I didn't get any help. I didn't ask any questions. I got my ticket to heaven if you're a Christian, and I guess that was it. That's catastrophic, and it's totally unnecessary because you can, by faith, go down that road and look back and say, God, what is it that I would like to see have happened in there? What what does even the Scripture say is possible? If I yield my life to you, if I let someone disciple me, if I figure out what you intended for me, then the next years, however many of those there are in my life, could be revolutionary, transformative have massive impact. My life could be changed. Other people's lives could be changed. unless, Or I could just sit here and do nothing like I've been doing if that's what you've been doing. Are you willing to go down the road, look back, 2020 hindsight vision from the future and say, what decisions can I make today that will change that period of time? Go to Galatians chapter 6. Just a few more here and we'll shut it down. Galatians chapter 6. Um... And I'm going to this word, deceived. Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let each of us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. My wife got some flour, found some seeds in a package, went out, a, a, a empty potter with some plant, with some dirt, and she shoved those seeds in the uh, pot. Guess what is growing in the pot? The thing she planted. We didn't plant those flowers and go out there, oh, dear Lord, it'll be a miracle, but we pray for watermelons. I know we planted flowers, but we ask you in Jesus' name for a miracle. You think that's silliness. Why are you going to plant one thing and then pray something else happens? It ain't going to happen. Why? Don't deceive yourself. You can't plant something and then say, oh, I'm going to sow my wild oats and pray for a crop failure, as they used to say. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that you're going to reap. So, Here's the deal. If you're sick of your crop, change your seed. I'm sick of this crop that keeps coming in. These consequences, this this discipline, I'm sick of this. God says, that's the point. I'm allowing this stuff to happen. I'm turning the dial of the consequences so you'll go, uncle, time out. I'm out. I'll do whatever you say. And then you finally yield, and then you find someone to say, look, I can't do this by myself. I don't know what I'm doing. I got my ticket to heaven, and I don't, know how to, I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to make it between here and there. It's a really bumpier road than I thought, and I'm going back to old things. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It talks about were some of you. List all this list of things that these people were, and he says of such were some of you. You're not those people anymore. And it's possible to live a life beyond that sin and, and that deception. Um, Oh, Colossians 2. Go to Colossians 2. And by the way, I didn't give you this on, on Galatians 6, 7, the do not be deceived. The word for deceive is to cause to roam from safety, truth, or virtues, to go astray, seduce, wonder, be out of the way. Here, little boy, over here, little boy, over here. Come with me. You'll be safe. No, you'll die. This is not a game. Steal, kill, destroy. That's his plan. That's what he's after. Colossians 2, verse 6. 
As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So just pay attention. And again, if, you, if, you, if you're not in the scriptures, when you hear a lie, you won't know it's a lie. And I've told you the deal about the secret service, counterfeit money. They take secret service agents, they handle counterfeit money, they put them in a vault. And how do you think they teach them to, to recognize counterfeit money? They would put them in a vault for days counting real money, not counterfeit money. And the second counterfeit money touched their hands, they'd go, counterfeit money. Because they had handled the real thing so much. So stay in the scriptures, handle the scriptures. Then when the world comes along with some idea, you say, no, that's not what scripture says. Instead of, oh, let me think about that. Or, oh, I'll pray about that. That sounds interesting. It's garbage maybe. But we don't want to offend anybody. Right? We want to be nice. Jesus was not very nice in John chapter 8. Trust me. Okay? Nice most of the time, but with these guys, he went at them. What else we got here? 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, writing to Christians, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as from us, as though the day of Christ had come, like it's already happened. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So you say, well, how will we know it's about to go down? The Antichrist will be in the temple of God claiming to be God. You can go read about this in the book of Revelation as well, and that's going to happen. Then you say, okay, this is coming. Until then, we're not there yet. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then, and probably the Holy Spirit being referred to here, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish and then look at who they are because they did not receive the love of the truth and that they might be saved and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So I grew up around guys that pounded on pulpits and towels and sweating and taking coats off and screaming and hollering. I'm not screaming and hollering at you, but I'm telling you, it's a warning. If you're a Christian... You're going to make heaven no matter what. I'm encouraging you to go down the road a little way and look back and say, Lord, is anything going to be different about my life from death to now than it was from now to birth? And I need to make some decisions to yield my life to you, to obey you, to, be, to stay in the scriptures, abide in your word, to be sure that I know what the truth is and that I'm not just a hearer of the word only, but a doer of the word and that I get on with the life you intended. So that's if you're a Christian. You say, well, I don't want to do any of that. You're going to make heaven anyway. You're just going to wish you had paid attention to what was read today. Because it says you will suffer loss. If you are not a Christian, as calmly as I try to say this along the way, this is not going to go well. Imagine there's no heaven. There is. Imagine no hell below. There is. And you will end up in a real heaven or a real hell based on your relationship or not with Jesus Christ. The only way... To end up in hell is to reject Jesus. It's, it's not like God's up there going, yes, another one went to hell. They're not cheering for this. What do you want him to do? He's given his only son, suffering down on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead to get you into heaven. And you have the possibility today to be a birthday, a second birthday, 
And then you go down the road and look back and say, before that day, it was like this. But since that day, it's been like this. And now not only do I have the promise of eternal life in heaven with God, but I have people around me who are going to show me how to live where I go from darkness to light, the power of Satan to the power of God, from literally death to life, and live the life that he intended. So ask God today to give you some 2020 hindsight, vision, how you can change your life, but how you could go down the road and look back if you made the biggest decision of your life today. It would change not just your life, it would change your eternity. And that is possible through Christ his son. Father, we thank you for your word. And I thank you for people in this room and beyond who are making big decisions. And for whatever reason, they may have heard it somewhere before, maybe never heard it in their lives, but today is their day and they would say, God, I don't know why I've pushed back and yielded, not yielded and argued and come up with all these excuses. I've believed lies my whole life and finally I know now I hear truth. So I, I agree, I believe, I accept that you love me, that you love me so much that in spite of my sin, I am a sinner, I need forgiveness, and you were willing to send your son Jesus, who literally knew no sin, perfect, sacrificed, died on a cross, buried, raised from the dead, shed his blood to pay for my sin, and I need his payment applied to my debt, to my sin, to my life. So I accept his payment. I changed my mind. I cannot fix it. Only you, can, only you can fix it. And I ask you to come live in me in the person of the Holy Spirit. Fill me from the inside out. Confirm to me that I am your child, that I have been born into your family. Thank you for loving me, for saving me, for changing me. And that now I don't just have eternal life with you forever. I have an abundant life, package deal, built into the offer. And I want to get in on that abundant life. Send people to help me, Lord. Help me reach out if I have questions. Not be too, too afraid or proud to ask the questions and to grow up and get on with the life that you intended and not waste any more time. And Father, for those that are believers and they look back and see maybe some growth but a lot of mess in some cases and they've gone down the road to the day of their death potentially and look back and said, God, something's got to change. Help me make decisions today that will affect literally my rewards in heaven, but also the rest of my life and the interactions I have with my family, friends, even complete strangers. So uh, you're the best. We love you, Lord. We thank you for coming after us, staying after us, and uh, that we'll be with you forever if we're in your family. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.